if you look at baseball, mm -hmm. Red Sox and Yankees always bring in the big free agents. Mm -hmm. But o the Oakland A's don't have a big uh, right. payroll, but they always develop their own talent. And then right. when they get to a certain point, the bigger markets you know, take those players, but they can always compete. And so right. if you really invest in your farm team, you yeah. can build your own talent. And I think there's greater loyalty and it ties into mm -hmm. our cultural piece of For sure. people are more loyal to the company if they feel like they've got a career progression sort of laid out in front of them. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Or all of them. Why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. The first question, Lou, that I always like to ask our guests is what their morning routine looks like. So do you have a go-to morning routine that you stick to? I do. To? I do. Uh, I live in Boston, or outside of Boston, and I have a hockey rink in my backyard. So the first really? thing I do in the morning is I take a skate for about an hour. What? Are you serious? Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's really cool. I, I was waiting. I was waiting for like the smile to crack. You're like, no, I'm kidding. I don't have an ice rink. Now, is it an actual like built ice rink, or is it like frozen water that you just? It's rely frozen on? water. I put it down on a tennis court with some boards and a liner. That's awesome. And ready to go when it gets cold. What do you do before or after? Is there like, are you eating before? Or are you eating after? Oh, after. Yeah, okay. coffee and, and breakfast after. That's honestly, I'm, that is amazing. I'm astonished. I was not expecting that answer. <laughs> uh, you don't hear that. It's a great way to wake up. Great way to wake up. I believe you. I'm like caught off guard right now. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and we can end the podcast. <laughs> yeah, there you have it. Go ice skating if you want to be successful. <laughs> so, Lou, you wear a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you lecture, you're an investor, an advisor. If you had one title, if you had to pick one, what would that be? That um, encompasses all of that. Yeah, I guess uh, active uh, board investor. So uh, actively working with CEOs, uh, <coughs> usually early stage companies, and helping them with their go-to-market. So uh, it's one of the reasons I'm so excited about what Gong does, because it's so uh, revolutionary in terms of helping companies scale their sales organizations. Very cool. And you got your start uh, selling encyclopedias door to door, correct? I did. Yeah. What uh, happened to you where you thought that, hey, as tough a job as that is, I want to keep keep doing sales? Like, did you fall in love with the door to door grind? Were you just a big uh, fan of encyclopedias? <laughs> <laughs> well, I needed to pay for college. Okay. And uh, that was uh, the best way to do it because it was 100% commission. And in and in some ways, going on boards is a complete. Uh, you know, you know, coming right back to like a hundred percent commission. You go, you go right. on a, a startup board. You don't get any money. You're, get, yeah. you're betting on the equity, and you're betting that it'll be a good outcome mm -hmm. over time. It's like a hundred percent commission plan. You know, yeah. there's no guarantee. You don't get a salary. For sure, but sure. you definitely learn the the concepts of you know, sort of learning to not take rejection personally and sort of right. character building days, which is exactly what a lot of startups have. You have a lot of character building days that you have to get through yeah. to uh, power through because as a startup, you have no right to exist. Just like a sure. salesperson mm -hmm. doesn't have a right to sell any books. You just have to earn it. That's interesting. The amount of uh, ownership that you had from the beginning of your career to now is probably a theme, right? Like yep. you're just like, hey, if I if I'm gonna you know earn a paycheck, I'm literally going to earn the paycheck <laughs> back exactly. against yep. the wall style. <laughs> That's great. Yep. So, you know, during your sales career, um, you know, you've been a leader at a lot of different companies, including Avid Technologies, Webline, Citrix Systems, and others. Was there ever a time during uh, your sales career where you were like, hey, sales is just really hard. Why did I go into this profession? I don't think it's for me. Did you ever have that feeling and, and why so? Uh, I never had that feeling. I did have the feeling of what you sell really does have to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And... Um, when you don't get that right, it can be really painful for the customer and the company. And yeah. so really selling what's sort of on the truck or what your product really is supposed to do does well. I have to give you this one quick story. When I was in, yeah. living in Asia, I opened the uh, offices for Avid in Japan and I ran the Asia Pacific region. And we came up with this new product and I sold the very first one in the company. And um, I sold it to a big broadcaster in Korea. And when they turned it on, it literally caught fire. <gasps> no. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an okay. episode of Silicon Valley. It literally Valley. caught fire. And because um, it wasn't tested, we were growing really fast. We were entering a new market. We didn't realize, you know, sort of testing of, you know, 
broadcasters with stuff on air. Sure. This thing, you know, obviously it wasn't on air because it had caught fire and went down. And it just really taught me the importance of being really honest with your customers and, and sort of the hard way of learning uh, what you sell them. They have to, they're trusting you, and you have to make sure that you know what you say you're selling, what the product does, uh, does what it says it does, you know, mm-hmm. and is properly tested. Mm-hmm. You weren't there in the room when it. Person I was, were you? No, I was, <laughs> I was in Tokyo, and I got a call from our distributor in Korea, and it was, it was a very ugly one. I had to jump on a plane and go over, and as they say over there, fall on your sword. I mean, to, yeah. And I kept the account, but it was the one time to your question where I thought, you know, it wasn't that sales wasn't for me. It was just that you just have to take this pretty seriously. It's funny now. Yeah. But yeah. The oh, yeah. In the was, moment, it was not funny. <laughs> Definitely not. Well, I was like, my next question was, Lou, what did you say when you were standing in the room with your new client and your product <laughs> burst into flames? Because that's a line I'm stealing, for sure. Whatever got you out of that one. Hunting around for the fire extinguisher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you ultimately became the CEO of three different companies, mm-hmm. Reflectant Software, which you sold to Citrix, Turbonomic, and most recently, Black Duck Software in the Boston area. What experiences do you think best help set you up to transition from being a sales re- leader to now running an entire company? Mm. So, um, as you know, in a, in a small company, you really got to do two things. Well, you got to build a product and you have to sell the product. And the best companies are good at doing both of those really well. I mean, mm-hmm. there's companies that are successful that may be better at product than at sales or sales and at developing product. But the best companies are really good at both and take mm-hmm. both really seriously and take them as sort of areas where you can continuously learn. And so um, what I did was I, I went from sales to CEO and then I sold my company to Citrix and then I became a product group general manager at Citrix mm-hmm. and got a whole bunch of different products to run. And that's kind of, I think, where I really learned product development because it was, you know, multi-product, large, larger company. So that when I went back to Turbo and when I went to Black Duck, which is more single product companies, I had a much better sense of how you had to build it and, mm-hmm. then, and then focused on how to sell it and make it more efficient as you, as you grow the sales team. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And, and tell us a little bit more about that sales team. Like uh, how large was the Black Duck team? Maybe from when you started to whenever you exited, uh, who'd you guys sell to? Yeah. So Black Duck was a really f- phenomenal company. Um, the first version of the product, they right when open source became... Mm-hmm. you know, a big thing. They built a massive knowledge base of, of all the open source projects. And what we'd do is we'd take uh, your code, scan it again, and match it to our code and tell you what all the open source was in your, in your code base. So the first customers were in the, in the sales model deployed was like your classic Oracle out of the 90s, you know, huge deals, right. sales engineers on site with big iron, long sales cycles and it was kind of a really hard product to use but it was like plumbing once you get it in mm-hmm. you're not taking the plumbing out it's just sure. too painful to take it out yeah so that was what i inherited it was about a 15 million dollar business growing at like 20 percent a year but it so we needed to redo the product we needed to you know basically build a um, cloud ready you know virtual sure. product that you could download and, and have uh uh, freemium versions and all that sort of stuff. But then we had to transition the sales team from this classic enterprise big iron to yeah. what we called the velocity model. Sure. And that's that's really where we made the biggest difference because we could do what a lot of, I think a lot of your customers do is, you know, have a downloadable product that you can then um, scale the sales team. And what we did was went from sort of a big, heavy, direct sales team to, we still had some of those, those field salespeople, you need sure. them for the big deals. But we really invested in sort of, you know, the inside velocity yeah. model. Yeah, that's uh, around that time is, or at least the velocity model is like how I got my start, right? Like oh, okay. I, yes. Yeah, I was, I mean, given it was only about six years ago, so not, yep. not as long ago. But it, it, I've been at companies where they're moving from that uh, have to be on premise, have to be like very hands on to trying to get a shift in the whole company mindset of like, yes, we'll keep that light on but we need to build this new engine internally. Yes. And when I was there, I realized it wasn't just a skill thing. It was like a talent thing as well, right? Like the yep. type of people you had to bring in are very different. What were some of the challenges that you oh, had you, shifting, hiring, oh, going so, to market? Like I'm sure we could spend three hours on that alone. But on <laughs> that. Because it gets into what your sales, sales culture is, right? Mm-hmm. Because the traditional inside model would be, you know, somebody, you know, making cold calls to set up meetings for the person in the field, yeah. right? Sure. Which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But the, this, this model we're talking about, the velocity model, is where you bring in, um, we brought in a lot of younger men and women that never 
sold anything before right out of right. college, right. trained them up, uh, used sales enablement extensively, and then uh, organized them. We had sort of an interesting way we organized. We, we built what was called a plane. And a plane had a pilot, a co-pilot, a gunner that was doing outbound prospecting, and a navigator that was dealing with inbound leads marketing generated. Interesting. And the way you scale that plane, that unit of sales capacity, is when it's covered its costs, it co you know, basically covered their quota, their expenses, you launch a new plane, you take the co-pilot and make him or her the new pilot. Mm -hmm. And we started with one and we ended up with 20. Hmm. And But we knew exactly where we were on our cost structure when you launched a new unit of sales capacity, a, a new plane. Hmm. Right. And that's um, that model we've now, I'm on a couple of boards where we've deployed that. We, uh, a company is called Century One in uh, North hmm. Carolina is going through the exact same thing. So it's a little bit different because the customers are a little different, but the basics are the same. Sure. No, it's interesting. I've heard of like kind of like the, for inside sales, like the, I guess like pod model, yeah, which pod. is something yeah, similar. Pod or plane. Or, yeah, I like yeah. plane way better. It sounds yeah. much cooler. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the one at Turbo, we called them buses, but like I got to Black Duck and we're like, why would you drive a bus if you could fly a plane? Yeah. Right. So right. we named it's our planes and so the, the, yeah. the sales teams loved having their plane. Plus, I mean, you could be an SDR, you could be a gunner. What sounds exactly. cooler to me? Yeah. That would be a gunner. I mean, sounds way cooler. I don't know if there's bunner, uh, gunners on the bus. <laughs> Can you explain to me again in that model, like, what is each, like, what's the difference between what's, each plane? Or, like, what's the new, the next iteration of that? Yeah, so, well, we started with one plane in one yeah. sort of large region, most of the, the USA. Um, and then we got to 20, we had them all around, you know, covering all the U.S. We had them in Europe, um, but the, the basic idea was the co-pilot and the gunner and the navigator owned the sales qualified lead uh, quota. So mm -hmm. they had a quota for leads. The pilot was the one that was closing the larger deals. And we were doing sort of 20, 30, 40K deals. Got and it. then the pilot would own the, um, the sales qualified lead definition or uh, quota. And then the, if that co-pilot could start to close little deals, we thought he or she was good, mm -hmm. we could launch the new mm -hmm. plane with them running it. Mm -hmm. And then... Mm -hmm add on a gunner and a navigator and another co-pilot. It's, it's a version of the, the farm model. To, to it's an totally extent, a farm to system extent, yeah. model. Exactly. Yep. Like and that, that was actually, it's a really interesting point because the first quarter, first year at Black Duck, I kept trying to hire field sales reps. I remember talking to a board member and I said, I was over 10. I literally hired 10 and I, they washed out the other quitter. Really? And, yeah. They just didn't, it just didn't work. Hmm. Yeah. And so I went to the board and I said, I can either try to go one for 11 mm -hmm. or I can do a completely different model. Yeah. yeah. And they were very, um, very good investors and very patient and said, give it a try. Because once you have that farm system, yeah. it's a perfect analogy. You grow your own talent. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to br keep bringing free agents in. Yeah. The totally. best reps I've ever worked with for the most part, like 90% of them were probably, were, or, you know, an SMB rep at the company, and then they became they the best up. enterprise rep. Or here at Gong, they're the you know AE or excuse me, the uh, SDRs that are handling SMB, which yeah. kind of like our entry other than inbound. And fast forward a year later, literally the the best rep in December started in that role, and yep. it's because they get more conversations, mm -hmm. they know your buyer persona, they know the product so much better than someone who's trying to do a three month ramp time, right. and they just got done selling you know Black Duck software. Now they're gonna come sell Gong, right? It's totally, yep. totally where different. Did you, where did you sell, what company? Uh, I got my start at ClearSlide, mm -hmm. so selling oh, to sales sure. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to think of it as uh, you know the thing that never was. Uh, it, was almost, it was really close, but the example I was sharing earlier from uh, the on-premise to SaaS was a company called On24. Okay. So they did broadcasting, that's what kind of triggered it, the broadcasting on site for these huge webinars, and then they tried to move to a SaaS model. Mm -hmm. And I remember being there and it was like the people that were really successful were the ones who had the old book of business and they're yes. like they they no, the lights aren't turning off anytime soon those reps were great mm -hmm. new reps like me that came in and were like we're trying to sell a SaaS product that made sense to me but the people we were trying to sell it to weren't really ready for that and the business right. wasn't ready to change in a way from like comp to plane or pod structure like i remember the first pod we tried to build didn't go so well. So like I've been there and I know it's like, it's way more than just, oh, we'll start selling SaaS. It's like, no, you right. really need to start right back at the bottom and start thinking through these things. And I think the farm systems are really good, good yeah. way to do that. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, you look at the classic example I used when I sort of described it to my board was, you know, if you look at baseball, mm -hmm. Red Sox and Yankees always bring in the big free agents, mm -hmm. but o the Oakland A's don't have a big uh, right. payroll, but they always develop their own talent. And then right. when they get to a certain point, the bigger markets, you know, take those players, but they can always compete. And so right. if you really invest in your farm team, 
You yeah. can build your own talent. And I think there's greater loyalty, and it ties into mm-hmm. our cultural piece of For sure. people are more loyal to the company if they feel like they've got a career progression sort of laid out in front of them. Yeah, sure. I think that's, like, the best thing, which is, like, hey, like, whether it's, you know, Gong or whatever company is, like, hey, would, like, should I go work there? Would you recommend it? The first thing I think people think of is, like, yeah, my career growth, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I started here, and they're, I'm two levels up. Or me, I used to be in sales. Now they let me move to marketing, which is pretty – That's pretty, awesome. Yeah, which is yeah. pretty uh, rare – both I think in the journey itself, but then like a VP of sales being like, yeah, you're a top salesperson. Go ahead, go join marketing. Like that's usually a kind of a no go. Um, but it definitely impacts our culture because now we're hiring like crazy and we have great stories to tell. Well, that's a great, it's a great example in th- what we were wanted to talk a little bit about was sales enablement. We yeah. did the same thing here. When we brought in people, we put them through our head of sales enablement. We all had the theme of uh, black duck. We put them into flight school. So to get mm. through flight school, you had to get your wings and you had to prove that I you could this. do an outbound call and all this sort of thing. But a number of the, the people we brought in who thought they wanted to be in sales actually were more interested in enablement. So we oh. moved them over. And what was unique about that model was we embedded an enablement person into one of these planes. Interesting. So, okay. so this way, so one of the risks with this model is if you launch a new plane before the co-pilot's ready. Right. And I did that. You, you can, it can be bad. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. someone's just not ready for the job. Sure. If you put your head of enablement in and they can actually close deals, then they get the instant respect of the sales team yeah. yes. and can can uh, basically temporarily run a plane until we hire another pilot for yeah. that plane. So sure. it, was really, it was a really cool cultural thing. And then for President's Club, the head of sales enablement was always the, the number one nominee to come down and uh, enjoy awesome. everything. That's cool. And, and probably pretty rare. At least a lot of the companies I've worked at um, and even sold to and just like working with, like sales enablement doesn't always have a seat at the table. Right. And I think it kind of comes into if anyone's ever trained a sales team, if you ever walk into a room and try to s- train salespeople, the first thing they like look up is like, have you ever sold before? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's like, how are you exactly. going to tell me I've, how to close a deal if you've never closed one or you've closed five, 10 years ago? You know what I mean? Right. So it's like the fact that you guys took a closer put it into a sales enablement role and then kind of reintroduced it into that pod or that plane, it can really have like uh, a big uh, advantage for the, the closing team. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Cause I think most people, when you hear the word training or enablement, they think training yes. and you, you're about to go to your kickoff, right? You're going to do yeah. some training, but that's one thing and in, in, yeah. in, in really good enablement that I've found is not just quarterly or monthly, but it's daily and weekly. Mm-hmm. And if someone's embedded in the team, they can listen to the calls using products like Gong and then do the instant training and give the reps right. feedback on what's going well uh, or, wh- or what's not going well to solve right. their problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Touching a little bit on this, so um, clearly you see sales enablement as super critical to making sure the sales team is successful. Uh, what are all of the responsibilities um, for, of sales enablement? So, of yep. course, training, onboarding is part of that. How else would you describe that function? Yeah, so we, the, the way we described it would be first they ran flight school, uh, and, and then they um, would, would also um, be embedded on the plane mm-hmm. and be the go-between between traditionally product marketing and the right. sales team. Right. Mm-hmm. So our head of uh, sales name, a guy named Chester Lewis, actually an MIT PhD. And oh. he, but he was technical enough. He had been in product management, but he, he respected and understood sales. So he could be this go between and it was a trusted person on both sides. So instead of it being product marketing coming in, here's the new products every quarter. Mm-hmm. This was a weekly, Chester would put a new deck together and say, we just ran into this competitor over here mm. and do an instant training session. And then um, you know, launch that. So what it ended up doing was he'd identify problems and help develop content for the sales team, but he'd also take sort of the tribal knowledge of the successful salespeople and spread it out. Yeah. Because like when, when you think about the term sales enablement for an old timer like me, like, like when I went into tech in 1990, I would have been like, what are you talking about? What is sales enablement? But I didn't realize the power of it is because what it did was it enabled us to grow our sales team, but shorten the ramp time. Mm-hmm. And we actually paid for it by knowing we could take someone from sort of six months to four months in terms of ramp yeah. time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are hard dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's something, I, I mean, I, I always kind of tease like every sales job I've ever had and almost everyone my friends have told me about when they started a new one is, you know, it's a three month ramp. Yeah. Um, which I always thought was weird because I was like, if you sell life sciences at Salesforce and I sell Gong and you sell to accountants, how are all of our onboarding <laughs> three months long? Like this exactly. is kind of crazy to me. Yeah. I was like, in an ideal world, it's probably three months or less. Um, and that was like some of the fun parts of speaking to sales leaders last two years is like, yeah, our, our onboarding process is, is uh, three months, Lou. It's like, okay, so what is it really? 
Right. And that's when you get, okay, well, it really takes about six months, really takes about eight months. And that's where a lot of sales enablement, I think, can get a seat at the table if they don't already at that organization by saying, hey, here's the ROI or the impact if we even just shave off two weeks or if we shave off a month or if that time to first close is is shorter. And it's a really, I don't want to say easy, but it is, I think, on the lower hanging fruits of ways that you can get uh, more dollars out of your sales team. Absolutely. Yeah. But ultimately you do justify it by saying you are going to ramp them, whatever from six to four or three to two or whatever. What are some of the other metrics that you think are super helpful for uh, sales enablement teams to measure, um, other than ramp time? Yeah. Well, so the, the other piece of, uh, of, of what we did at black talk, which I think was special was the intersection between sales enablement and sales operations. Mm -hmm. And in sales ops at Black Duck, uh, I had it report to me as a CEO. I didn't have it report to sales because what I wanted was Mm -hmm. a single version of truth. You know, I didn't want sales is truth and marketing is truth. And then I was the referee in the middle. I needed somebody to just say, this is the truth. These are the real conversion rates. This is really what's happening. And so the, the piece of that where, you know, if we, when that person could identify the problems, it would just create a list of things for the sales enablement team to do. So one of the things they would do is do uh, A-B testing on email cadences, A-B testing on would this open work on a cold call? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. And would it work on this message that you leave? And that's what we, we, we did sort of the gong thing without gong. We recorded our own mm-hmm. uh, uh, calls, but it was nowhere near as powerful as what you have. Um, but it was, it was one of those things of just the culture was let's identify all the problems and solve it. And the minute yeah. you solve that one, you're going to find 10 new ones. Let's solve those. And then you're just getting more efficient. Mm-hmm. And it ultimately ended up <coughs> in terms of me as a CEO, it being able to improve my sales forecast predictability. And that's like, mm-hmm. that's, that's a nice way to live. It's no, yeah. it's no fun yes. to like make a quarter, miss a quarter, make a quarter, miss because you get, you know, it's just no way to live. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I was smiling when you said, uh, you know, the single source of truth. So you don't have sales coming to you with one thing and marketing coming right. to another. It, it sounds like you're using sales ops as kind of like an objective, a more objective view of what's yeah. really going on. Right. And in larger companies, it's typically always reported up into sales. And I can understand that. But in right. our case, we had real problems with forecast predictability. Mm. So the only way I could solve it was to put sales ops reporting to mm. me. And then <clears throat> initially our VP sales, who's terrific, Adam Clay, didn't really like the fact that he didn't own the forecast. But of course. what that enabled him to do was to build all the other things that a great VP sales or CRO does. Right. Like sales culture, training, yeah. Yeah. he brought in the enablement piece and all that sort of thing. It's probably a reframe, right? Where it's like, actually, if you think about it, I don't want to forecast. Right. It's kind of <laughs> awful. It's one of the worst <laughs> parts of the job. <laughs> but I also feel like uh, weird not doing not it. Doing it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I imagine it was probably tough if given it was the right time for your business, you said these large, really large deals. I imagine, you know, one or two of them doesn't come in. That's going to swing your forecast dramatically. Well, and that's what ultimately with this, this my kind of conversion to sales enablement had to do with being a CEO and, and making and missing because of the big deals. And, you know, the right. big deals are always impossible to forecast yeah. and somebody leaves or something happens, you know, procurement changes this or that. So this was a way for me to build about 40% of my business so that it was velocity. It was a math equation. Mm. Right. Then the other stuff, you're still going to have to do the big deals and those are really hard. But mm-hmm. if you're depending on every quarter, we'll make the quarter if, you know, JP Morgan closes. That's just, there's just no way to live. Those are miss. rough end of quarters, end yeah. of years when it <laughs> comes down to the wire of like, right. it's just a $4 million deal. And if you, it doesn't come in, we all miss our number. <laughs> exactly. If it and does, then the company bonus gets hit. So yeah. it's really a cultural thing. You need yeah. to try and build in this predictability. Um, I guess here's an interesting thought is, this, I think if I ask anyone in Silicon Valley, what does sales enablement mean? I get a different answer almost every time. I think, <laughs> Sheena, you're right. Onboarding is almost always a part of it. Mm-hmm. I've been at companies where uh, sales enablement does onboarding for everyone, even like a finance director, right? Versus just specific to sales. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of kind of the, I guess, like signs of maybe that the sales enablement isn't quite doing uh, their part. And I don't mean that they're not doing hard work. I'm not saying they're not putting their best foot forward, but maybe that they're you know, not quite directed in the overall goal of the sales team or, or the company. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's a really interesting question because there's a, a bunch of signs where you realize you need to, to fix a problem. And the, the problem I've tended to have in my career, both as a salesperson, sales VP, and CEO, is, is you get so excited about the growth of your business that you overhire. So mm-hmm. you, yeah. you put on too many reps too quickly they? and they're not all productive. And then you have a, a miss or two and then it's like, oh, why did you overhire? 
There's this great article written uh, by Mark Leslie. I don't, you know, Mark Leslie was the founder of Veritas, teaches the class I teach at, at Harvard and MIT. He teaches it at Stanford. Mm. He wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review years ago called The Sales Learning Curve. And it basically is about um, the y-axis is sales yield and the x-axis is time. And you need to know how steep your curve is. So for me, sales enablement was we, we tried to match, um, tried to track where our planes were actually on the curve. Mm. And it was hard to do, but when we did it, we felt complete confidence that it was time to launch a new plane. Right. Mm. And sometimes you just have to kind of overwork the people you have. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's, but it's better to do that than to put a whole bunch of new people in that, that aren't ramped. Yeah. And then, and then no, one's, no one's making their numbers. Well, especially when you're like in uh, a business where you're changing and shifting things. Like at Blackjack, you're trying to create a new model and you don't yes. even know what works and what doesn't work. You're still right. in that learning ex period. Ex experimental, yeah. Right. And so while you're experimenting and then trying to bring on new folks without yet knowing what is the silver bullet of what works, like that's also super complicated. Yeah. Right. So that's where enablement really helps yeah. because they did have a seat to the table and they could say, you know, I think we're doing this wrong or I think these people need help with this and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but it also started, when I talked about a great CRO setting the sales culture was mm -hmm. that that CRO, Adam Clay, wanted Chester to have a seat at the table. Wanted our seat. He, wanted, he, he let him, you know, report in his staffing. So he had a seat. And I think you need to do that to have people respect it. A hundred percent. And, and I've, I've been at companies where they do and they don't. And yep. it's almost like if you're not going to give them a seat at the table, it's kind of like why even have the right. discipline at all, right? Like why even bother hiring them and, and trying to build out a team versus when they do have the seat at the table and they're really aligned, it goes back to what you were saying where it's like, hey, let like let uh, let your CRO focus on the things he really wants to focus on. Let enablement start to find those gaps and start to fill right. them of like why the bottom 10% of your last hiring class isn't hitting quota a year later, right? Those starts of unknown questions, sales enablement if put in the right position can really start to answer. Well, and it's also interesting. I see this with certain founders um, that like I'm on the board of a company called Logs.io and the founder there, Tomer Levy. He didn't hire a CRO for the longest time because he really wanted to know where the problems were in the sales cycle. Hmm. So a founder can sort of help this mm -hmm. culturally because putting sales enablement in there was a piece of cake. He already believed in it. He didn't yeah. have, you know, in the early days, you got to do everything yourself. But mm -hmm. he realized over time that that was a key piece. But that was because, and maybe Gong's the same way, your founders kind of learned what the process was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, when I was, uh, I was the second sales hire here. Oh, you were? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I was here in the early, early days. Uh, and I'm sure anyone listening knows we, we record calls and you can yeah. hear them. So I'll tell you like the first week, like the first few calls I had to get like a comment from our CEO saying like, hey, good job. And I was like, oh, wait, he really hears he everything. Like, he it. knows <laughs> everything that's going on. And he still does now. Like, he, is, he, He's listening he must, like, listen to Gong all the time. But the point is, like, it's crazy when you have that visibility. And from a CEO, a co-founder, CRO, sales enablement, like, when you really hear the type of conversations are going on, you can solve them a lot quicker because yeah. you're hearing it firsthand. Like, you know, Devin's really knocking out of the park in this one thing. But it sounds like the three reps we have can't sell to sales ops, which is something that we did struggle with. So I can definitely say Because if not, experience. then they have to go back and interpret what happened on the call and explain it to him. Right. So if he's listening, he knows exactly what the voice of the customer is. Yeah. Because yeah. if you ask me how the call went, I'm going to tell you to great. Right. But if you hear the call live, you might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but but opinion. that's the thing. And that's why I think the velocity model is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Those conversations are happening, whether they're in the field and you're not listening to them. Right. Or you are in a, you know, most of your customers, are they like velocity type inside sales teams? I would say like majority are majority, like selling. Yeah. Uh, they're either inside or they're like the hybrid, which I think is yeah. becoming more popular, which is mm -hmm. realistically folks are selling with Zoom or, you know, yeah. go to, go to, um, Go to meeting. Meeting. Thank you. I was on a webinar today. I was like, that's <laughs> not right. Um, but you then it's like, but if we can get them in front of somebody, we want that too, right? That too, but then yeah. it becomes, now we have a blind spot in terms of why is one of our sales reps going on the field all the time and closing, and why is the other one going on the field all the time and not closing, right? right? And mm -hmm. so there's a, there's a gap there. Can Gong cover that too? We can. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we oh, do in person. Cool. We uh, yeah. You can pull out your on mobile app. phone and put on the, oh, put on the table. Oh, that's right. I had a friend who was telling me about the mobile app for, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's cool. So you can get all... Get all that data, get the Everything. call. Yeah. Even if it's, oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's really cool. And that's, I think, like, uh, again, like just having been a seller is like, those are the, like, the, the ultimate black box. It's like, what is happening on those in person meetings that, you know, it's just the rep, right? You want to know what's going on if, they're, yeah. if it's working mm -hmm. or not. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. I've used it a few times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you've been at companies that have been at various stages yep. uh, where you may have, started sales enablement i'm not sure but would would be curious to know 
when is the right time to develop a sales enablement function? Like, is it a certain number of reps that you need to have? Is mm. it a certain revenue target? What are, what's that measurement of, hey, now is the time this VP of sales or whoever's leading can't be doing this anymore? Yeah, it's a great question because I, I, I have found that I had such success with the scaling sales enablement at Black Duck that I'd talk to little companies and say, you know, put sales enablement on it. Like, we don't have, you know, we don't even have sales ops yet. You Because yeah. it usually starts with, Finance does sales ops, and then at some point you put sales ops that reports in to the function, and then and then it's enablement. I think the, the answer to that is that sort of culturally, if you build a, a culture of continuous learning mm -hmm. and celebrating failures, then I think you're building enablement into the culture to begin with. Right. Um, but then it's probably 10 reps or 15 reps where you'd have maybe somebody part-time doing sales enablement. Mm -hmm. And that's where it usually gets borrowed from product marketing or product management or yeah. something like that. Right, right. So, so it sounds like it's more of an issue of, of bandwidth and yeah. scale than, than time. But if you if you do it or slice somebody's time to do pieces of it early, I mean, if you have 10 sales reps, I think you're starting to build the culture in that this is an important part of us yeah. getting better. And, you know, because I think the other thing is if you're the top rep in some ways, when you're the top rep, you're like, I'm not going to tell anybody what I'm doing. I'm the top rep. You know? I've, heard that. I've heard that at <laughs> every company I've ever worked and at. And so the building the enablement into the culture makes it like we really want to take what Devin's doing so well and, mm -hmm. and let everybody else get better. Right. Because mm -hmm. you're going to keep getting better. Yeah. But if you bring everybody else up, that's where you start to really see the payoff because your productivity is so much higher overall. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oops, Speaking sorry. of duck. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I love that. That's my Did old black that? duck. <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, were you just like, when you got the iPhone and they had that ringtone, I have to imagine it was like, yes. This was made for selected. me. Selected. I yeah. can't give it up. I've been gone from black duck for two years, but I still have the ringtone. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's great. What are some of the key traits that you look for when hiring a sales enablement manager? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure. Two or three things. First, um, a natural affiliation with sales, and they don't sort of look down their nose at it. Like they recognize it's a hard um, domain that you have to you have to learn it and respect it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that you're pretty technical about the product, so that you could help diagnose a problem a sales rep that maybe isn't very technical could be having. So, someone with product background, a little bit of product background, maybe product marketing, product management, mm -hmm. maybe even engineering, but more likely somebody who's already been at one of those pieces of the organization that does both talk to engineering and talk to the salespeople. Mm -hmm. And then, but, and not necessarily, you won't find many that have already carried a bag or had, had a quota carrying assignment, but that if they've earned the respect of the salespeople and sort of understand how tough the job is, then I think, then it could, could, could work. I think the best sales enablement people are probably sold encyclopedias door to door. <laughs> 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 I couldn't resist. That was too good. <laughs> What's the most important skill that you think sales leaders should focus on this year? Um, <clears throat> sure, so I'd say celebrating what isn't working and building mm -hmm. into your culture of let's if you if you miss why let's let's try and get better because the the thing that that I think and I and these are mistakes I've made is if when you miss and you miss a quarter you tend to want to say we would have made it but or mm -hmm. you know we almost got there. But if you really are honest with yourself, you can look back and see if you have good enablement, you have good sales ops, you're going to see the miss coming and you just have to be honest about it yeah. Yeah. because then you can do something about it. But when you miss after you say you're going to make it, that's what's really bad culturally and sort of a morale hit for the company. If you see halfway through the quarter, you know, things aren't trending the right way, then, that's, then, then you can solve it. And this is where... I think the integration between sales and marketing becomes so clear. And mm -hmm. that's where one of the things we did at Black Duck was we anchored the sales qualified lead definition and paid marketing on it. Yes. So, so it was really, there was never, we did these MQLs, why did you sales guys miss? It was like we were all making SQLs and that's what, that's what everyone got paid on. That's great. It yeah. kind of reminds me of it's a sports analogy, but like, um, when, like I'm a big basketball fan. So it's like at the end of a game when you miss the game winner and you lose the game, you know, so it's easy to say, you know, it's, it's on you. You missed the game winning shot. That's why we lost. It's like, well, realistically, you probably lost somewhere in the second or third quarter. Exactly. You started, mm -hmm. you know, Might have been a foul beat. shot. Yep. Yeah. Right. Missing foul shots or, you know, poor defense, whatever it is. And it's it's harder to do at the end of the quarter to look back and say, like, well, it was actually that poor defensive, uh, you know, makeup we had in the second quarter. or The fact that pipeline gen was low in second quarter. Exactly. And easy to say, yeah. well, if JP Morgan had come in. If only then right. we would have been fine. But that's that's not really true. It's not right. That's yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that's, I think, a culture issue. What kind of culture do you build? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Last question for you, Lou. Yep. We ask everybody that comes onto the show. How would you describe sales in one word? Business. 
Oh. The fastest response <laughs> I think yeah. of all time. <laughs> well, this is where I get into like because we teach this class now at, at at Harvard Business School. For the longest time, they didn't teach sales. Yes, yeah. they called it marketing or they called it something else. And they've mm -hmm. finally really gotten in the last five or six years to say, you know, we really do need to look at this as a an area of uh, expertise that you can explore and get better at. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's more around the lines of most people think the best salespeople are the born salespeople, but you know, what we're talking about here with enablement is that you can teach it, you yeah. can sure. teach, teach it and, you know, get better at it, but through practice. This is great. Well, from ice skating to encyclopedias, <laughs> this has been a fantastic <laughs> Super interview. Fun. Thanks for joining well, thanks. us. Thanks. It's been really fun and congratulations on all the success you've had at Gong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Woo.